I am Sarah Jaffe. I write things on the internet a lot of the time, sometimes in actual print publications. I even wrote a book once. Um, and my book was about social movements since the 2008 financial crisis. And um, one of those things is that there is a renewed interest in socialism, in left politics, in protest that is aimed at changing the shape and power structure of our economy writ large. And the internet plays a role in that. What particular role it plays in that, we are going to hash out entirely on this stage in an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> and after that, we will have come up with all of the definitive answers. Um, that's not true at all. I used to have to argue with people that we were in a moment of renewed left protest and also to have to argue with people that social media was a significant factor in both our lives generally and politics in particular. I don't really have to make those arguments anymore, but now we get into a different set of arguments about whether and how social media is good, bad, stressful, useful. Um, whether we should all quit Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg is going to use all our data to become supreme dictator of the country. Um, and we're not going to talk about Russia, unless anybody wants to quote Lenin. Um, <laughs> so, well, hey, you know, Malcolm got us started with the communist revolution. So um, I'm going to start off here. You missed it. You missed it. It started last panel. <laughs> I want to start off by asking my panelists here to introduce themselves for just a couple minutes, talk about who they are, what they do, and how the internet does and does not play a role in that. And then I will have some questions, and then hopefully some of you will have some questions too. So um, I am going to make Emma go first. Emma, go this way. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Katerin. Um, I'm currently a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, but I've actually in 2008 election, and I bet no one else here did. But I would be pleasantly surprised if someone else did. Um, and I've also worked as a community organizer, and um, I'll be graduating from law school in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'll be moving to a more boring job. Um, but I'm uh, especially interested um, in uh, social media, um, I've run social media for a number of nonprofits and other sort of organizing projects. Um, and I'm a big believer in uh, the power of social media. And I think uh, the Democratic Socialists of America in particular have kind of proven the power of social media for uh, bringing about uh, socialism in this country. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to get into that stuff. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kevin Borden. I'm the director of a group called uh, MH Action, which uh, stands for Manufactured Housing Action. So um, manufactured housing is basically the new terminology for uh, trailer parks, right? So folks that own their homes but rent the land that their homes sit on. And so I'm sure y'all are like, why is someone who deals with trailer parks talking about the internet tonight? Yes. Um, so there's been this huge uh, shift in the trailer park sector for about 15 years. So there's a bunch of lads on Wall Street that um, all know a bunch of us are searching around for affordable housing. And you know a bunch of us are getting pushed out of urban cores like New York City or San Francisco or the Bay Area. And uh, investors over that time period have basically said, wow, like all these folks are getting pushed out of urban cores. There's when you get outside in exurban and rural America, there's these things called trailer parks um, that are usually owned and operated by mom and pops. Um, so guess what? Now's the time to gobble them up um, and basically consolidate this sector. So fast forward to 2018, and you, uh, when you think about um, the manufactured housing sector overall, there's about 2.9 million home sites in trailer parks across the country, about 680 to 720,000 of those folks are now writing a rent check to a corporate landlord. Um, and you know, you can imagine what happens when capitalism runs amok in any neighborhood, right? Rents go up, community maintenance goes down, and so we really formulated MH Action as a way to counteract that. Like, you know, we want to run some corporate accountability campaigns, which of course we know have has like a steel ceiling. You're not going to get these 
chaps on Wall Street, you know, might get them to act a little bit nicer, but not that nice her. Um, so, and then we also run like local and policy uh, state level campaigns to basically get their um, train of pre predatory equity off the tracks. And then we also are like, hey, we're in ex-urban and rural America. And, um, you know, even though folks are coming through the door to participate in MH Action on a housing insecurity issue that they're facing, we're also talking to folks about immigrant rights and, um, you know, retirement security campaigns and other public programs that we really do need to invest in. And uh, really, we, we Zuckerberg, helped build our organization in a way. We're somewhat shy about saying that because basically when you think about these chaps on Wall Street that have um, built out these investment portfolios, they all, spl they all splash it up on the web and they're like, look how much, how many communities I own. And so we basically take those communities, figure out a way to do um, targeted ads and outreach based on the zip codes of where those communities are located have those families basically come on to community calls and talk about their situation and then get involved in our organization. So really like a lot of our initial outreach to recruit people into the organization to participate in, you know, social and economic justice campaign literally starts online. So thanks for having me here and excited to get some good questions from the crowd tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Shuja. I'm uh, an internet user. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> once in a while, but um, I'm probably the, the least uh, uh, qualified person on this panel in terms of being an organizer. But, but the most uh, extremely online. Yeah, that's 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 the perspective I'm here to represent. Uh, is is the you know uh, total pathological obsession with the internet. Um, I'm also an editor at a magazine called Viewpoint, um, and I think. My uh, experience with the internet as an organizing tool has mainly been in terms of uh, trying to, you know, establish channels of communication, uh, of dialogue, of discussion, of commentary uh, in a way that's independent. Uh, Viewpoint Magazine is totally run by unpaid people who are just doing it, you know, for uh, uh, ideological convictions. Um, and so it's kind of been entirely, uh, it's entirely taken place online, uh, which is something that couldn't really happen before. Uh, I think, I think Irving Howe said one of one of the one of those guys said, "When intellectuals can do nothing else, uh, they start a magazine." Uh, but that was the 20th century. I guess now, when intellectuals can do nothing else, uh, they they go online. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that's part of. Uh, you know the the channels that the uh, the social media has opened up is that uh, there are new ways for people to uh, spread ideas and get in fights and so on, uh, and uh, that's what I'm here to to represent. To get in fights, yep. we're gonna fight. Hey, buddy. <laughs> um, so I asked you to start off by talking about your work, but the first question I want to ask you is the sort of big one: is if we are seeing a renewed interest in the left, in sort of far left politics, in socialism. Um, how has the internet, how has social media been a part of that? You know, small question, but just a few thoughts. Anybody have any? Yes, that's true. you can't Sorry. stockpile mics. Uh, do you want to um, Good. All right, I'll give it a I'll give it a shot. Um, I mean, the base that we're working with is uh, mostly in exurban and rural America, which um, you know I don't know. It's like I, a lot of my formative organizing careers was uh, was it based in Idaho, um, super progressive bastion in the country, and uh, like I do think that. Um, <clears throat> at least in terms of our organization at MH Action, it has helped us like capture folks that are like, you know, they're really pissed, right? They're just like, what the, f like, who am I writing my, like, sorry, I think I just almost swore. Is it, are you gonna swear a lot? I hope you, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. good, good. So, uh, so like, yeah, good, yeah, we're in between your beer anyway, so we could start 
swearing much more. So yeah, I think folks are really pissed, right? So it's like, they're like, we're writing this check to this corporate landlord. Like, who is this person? Like, they totally suck. Like, you know, what are we going to do? And you know, there's that, that initial like anger, like generally moves people in our organization for about four to six months. And then if they don't see any resulting solutions produced out of that anger, they tend to just peel off. So I think, you know, the role of how do you then spin out an ideology quickly enough, <laughs> um, especially when you're just getting some random contact from someone either from far west Utah or Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, or, you know, Humboldt County, California. It's like, I think, you know, what we're trying to figure out is like, okay, so we bring in folks, they're pissed off, we can get them on community calls, we can get them motivated around like a very, you know, Alinsky-like campaign, but we do have to figure out, I don't know if we've really figured out like, how do you then pivot to like a broader, deeper ideology that actually like starts to question stuff like the commodification of real estate? And what does that mean? And so we are starting to, um, uh, play around with that stuff much more. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Like I think generally what's been happening too with our membership base when we do that is, um, you know, a big chunk of our membership base are senior women. Um, and you know, when we start asking these, I think there's some, some level of like, Oh gosh, if we talk about ideology or if we start to like have calls about this, like our membership base is going to dwindle. It's actually like it's grown quicker. So I think folks are hungry for it. They realize that, you know, these like frat boys on Wall Street who really don't offer any value whatsoever to society, like shouldn't at some level maybe be around. This is being recorded. So, all right, we can, can we edit that part out just in case our organization gets sued at the end of this one? But I, I do think like there is a role for like um, pushing out like ideology on the internets um, to our folks. Could I just clarify? Is the is the question about the the who? Yeah, we are no. The question to, is or? is how has how is social media, the internet, useful to the sort of growth of the left that we've seen in recent? Okay, years? so. Um, we actually, uh, at DSA, we measure these things um, not always super precisely, but we do uh, make sure to track where our membership is coming from. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with DSA, I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that the majority of our membership uh, finds out about us through the internet, um, particularly through Twitter or through a podcast that shall not be named. It's Chapo Trap House, that's the bug. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, it does attract a very particular um, group of people. And I think that's been largely the kind of social media that we've put out. Um, we are also kind of uh, targeting a population that's very pissed off, um, but it's a population that um, of mostly younger, um, as they say, downwardly mobile people who uh, are pissed off um, and deal with it in, by sort of uh, uh, compartmentalizing it in, in sarcasm and irony and memes. Um, and uh, I don't think that's the only way that social media can be used, but it is one particularly um, effective way. I, uh, I also did a training with the, the NAACP where they talked about using social media particularly to reach out to communities of color. And I think the difference between what that social media looks like with a large sort of focus on what media is compatible with mobile phones, for example, which low income and people of color tend to use mobile phones more than laptops or computers uh, to access the internet. Um, just sort of things like that. Um, and uh, the one thing about DSAs, while it may be limited demographically, is it's been incredibly successful in terms of just uh, uh, numbers because people work 
you know, nine to five, they get off work and they're, they're pissed. They hate their job. They hate their situation. They were promised a sort of at least bearable life that they didn't wind up getting and we make jokes about it and we say hey those people who are saying oh we can fix that or you know tell me how you feel about your student loan debt and three emojis fuck those people um and that's a very uh a message that a lot of people are receptive to oh i have my own oh you have your own hoarding the means of production uh yeah it's a special, extra loud one. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess one of the things that makes me think about is that that the the internet doesn't just you know affect one ideological segment. I mean, it's made. I mean, if we think of the left as a subculture, which at this point, uh, in in the magnitude of American uh, politics, it has been uh, the internet has kind of uh, delocalized subcultures so that people uh, you know who are in maybe isolated in their local communities can connect to people in other places uh, and so these these can build partly uh, in the real world through the internet partly just on the internet uh, the most obvious example actually I think is 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 not on the left at all it's it's the alt-right uh, and maybe you know kind of apolitical groups that that do political stuff like anonymous or whatever um yeah so that's that's i guess there's a there's two different ways uh that this is taking place one is what's what's taking place online and the other is how uh the internet uh serves as a way of a channel to make things happen in in the uh, uh the meat space of uh of physical life um yeah, uh, and I, I guess my, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's it. <laughs> so you've all predicted most of my questions and just that one answer. Um, but I do want to get back to this question of who then is reached and how, right? Because I think we've all, you've all touched on that in a certain way of how do we think about what, who is going to be reached? One of the reasons I asked Kevin to be on this panel is because you're reaching people who we don't think of as the ones brought into the left by social media. Um, but that obviously is a different audience than people who listen to Chapo Trap House. Um, and so how do we think about who we're reaching and how to broaden, how to actually break this idea of the leftist subculture, but make it something that's broader? And how can the internet help with that? I have to start every time. Can no. I just like <laughs> make somebody else start next right. time? I will. So, um, gosh. Call on you, man. I know, right? I'm going to swear again twice this time. So, um, yeah, for the, I mean, the who for us is pretty straightforward, right? So I think I've covered that, already, that piece already. So it's folks that are in trailer parks, period. Um, folks that are, seeing their trailer park be bought out by a multi-state corporation. Um, that's another kind of defining criteria. And then I think, you know, there's a lot of talk on the left or in like progressive movements about scale. And, um, and a lot of the times we think about that in terms of like actual sheer numbers, like how many folks marched or mobilized on like the climate justice work, <clears throat> um, you know, these kind of big fancy pictures of thousands and thousands of people marching in the streets, which is great. But I think when we think about the use of the internet with how we're building work at MH Action, like I think scale is, has to be geographic. I mean, we're still mostly operating within the parameters of the American system, which makes a uh, senator in Wyoming just as powerful as a senator in California, right? So, like, I think um, when we're thinking, sometimes when we think about the who, I think we sometimes forget about the where. <laughs> and if there, if there is a place where the American left 
is potentially the thinnest. It's generally in exurban and rural geographies, but that was not always the case. Like if folks, right? If we all read like the books about where things were, you know, in the past century or so, it's like, you know, the Wobblies were blowing up the territorial governor in Idaho back in the day. And folks were spilling milk trucks in rural parts of Iowa and folks in North Dakota founded a bank, you know, and it's not to say like, yeah, that there's a lot of scary parts that happen around that, that type of movements in America, which completely like disregarded issues of race and gender, um, which we can, we have to struggle with and embrace, obviously, especially with the current administration. Um, but I do think, yeah, like the who for us is pretty easily definable within the context of the community that they live in. And then it becomes more about like, well, how does using the internet actually foment not only social movements, but real community, does it actually pull people offline into, into having those community potlucks where you can talk about, like have some popular education training modules where you dive into these issues around housing as a human right or retirement security or immigration justice. So I do think, um, yeah, I think sometimes we, think about the who a little bit too much and forget about the where. <laughs> and I think also when we think about our organization, like, you know, a lot of um, community organizations, um, you know, we generally do still rely on paid staff to do a lot of our coaching. We have just, we have three staff, so we're going to keep it pretty sleek, partially because I don't like to supervise people ever even though they're nice, it's just not one of my inherent skill sets. And so I think like, but on the positive side, like I think like if we tried to like staff up an organization like MH Action, it just wouldn't work. It would be administratively impossible to finance. Like you'd like just the mileage reimbursements alone would crush our budget. And so like, I think um, we do really have to think about like how are we gonna like break what the right has always defined as like a stranglehold on rural and exurban politics, which I actually think once you get out there, it's like their base is kind of thin um, from a real person perspective. Like I think like a lot of folks like, yes, there is the power of the alt-right, they've figured out this internet stuff pretty well, but once you start like kicking up some dust in rural and exurban America, like there's, there's more of us out there and I think we, give ourselves credit for. So. Um, I just want to build off uh, some of the things you said, because I think uh, a lot of that um, applies to the context uh, I've been looking at with uh, DSA. Um, most of my involvement with DSA has been through our uh, feminist working group. Um, and I'm from a, a small town in Virginia called Pocosin. It's like 10,000 people. Um, there are more police boats than police cars. And uh, uh, there's a DSA chapter in that area of Virginia now. And it's wild. There are DSA chapters, and I hope I don't screw this up, I believe in all 50 states now at this point, in maybe 49. Um, and, you know, places like Anchorage and Idaho and, um, you know, that in and of itself is pretty cool. But I, I think what's even more cool is just um, being able to reach out to these chapters, which are usually very small. You know, it's like three or four people. And there's one poor woman in that chapter who's like, please help me. I'm trying to inject some feminism <laughs> into this into this bro fest. <laughs> They're great guys, but they, <laughs> Bernie Sanders is not everything. <laughs> um, and uh, I know. <laughs> and um, uh, so being able to, to share resources um, in that sort of way, I think is made possible through social media, not just the ability to cross distances, but the fact that people feel comfortable reaching out uh, to us in the first place. Because I think one thing that DSA does far, far better than the majority of leftist organizations on the internet is that we're really personable and funny and 
nice to talk to. Um, we're mean to, you know, we're mean to some of the libs, but, you know, uh, and, you know, most leftist groups, you know, they essentially are just tweeting out their what they write in their newspapers, which, you know, is all well and good to have some of that content. But, you know, when I, you know, when I'm tweeting stuff, it's like, you know, cute animal pictures and like, you know, communist animals, communist animals and selfies and, you know, uh, treating about how I uh, drank too much coffee that day, you know, and these things that make people form a personal connection with me so that they're more receptive to when I go on like a 50 tweet rant about a federal job guarantee. Um, and I think it's that model uh, that is going to be what's going to be really effective for leftist organizing both now and in the future. <laughs> So uh, there was something you said, Kevin, about uh, how when you talk about who, you also have to talk about where. Uh, I think that's pretty key, especially when you think about what 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 do the Democrats keep fucking up? You know, every time they lose uh, in the national <laughs> elections, uh, the last two elections well. the Democrats lost uh, was was uh, you know uh, a win in the popular vote, uh, but you know a loss in uh, certain regions where Wisconsin. They, well. Yes. Uh, I'm going to die I mean, mad about Wisconsin. I've never been to Wisconsin. Have you? Yes, it's lovely. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and there was something Emma was saying as well about, about uh, the way people access the internet that uh, among lower income people usually is, is on their phones rather than on their computers, uh, which is a different interface. It's a different experience. Uh, and you know, laptops are kind of the college campus way of connecting, of plugging in. Uh, and and phones are not, not just in the US, but like all over the world, in the third world, uh, or in the global south, you, you, people are, when they're connecting to the internet, it's through, it's through smartphones. Um, so I, I think there's kind of like a, a cognitive gap here, because we tend to think of, uh, uh, Social media, particularly Twitter. I mean, everyone's on Facebook, but Twitter, where I, you know, a lot of these, the DSA membership is coming in and so on. Uh, it's a very small percentage of the population that uses it technically, uh, but at the same time, it's a more accessible uh, mode than you know uh, the traditional kind of channels of media. Uh, so I, yeah, I mean, that's something I guess to capitalize on, uh, which you know, obviously, the Democrats have not figured out how to do, and I think. Uh, we're, we're starting to, but we're obviously, we've got a longer way to go. Yeah. So when talking about, oh, come back in, yeah. Um, there's something you said that made me think about this, which is, it, it, it is a small, uh, not a, you know, not a majority of people in the, even in the United States, let alone the world, are on Twitter. But I think one thing uh, that's kind of deceptive about social media in general is, uh, we tend to look at, you know, who are we reaching on social media through uh, what Twitter calls engagements, when we really should be looking at it through what Twitter calls impressions. Uh, and the difference is engagements are things like liking posts, retweeting, commenting, things like that. Um, and, you know, for the majority of my uh, posts and the majority of posts on official DSA accounts that we use, that's about 5% of uh, the impressions, which are just people who look at the tweet. And, you know, when I talk to people who come to DSA meetings, I ask them, how'd you find out about this meeting? And it's almost always Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And, you know, I'll, you know, maybe later I'll ask, what do you think about, you know, this recent drama that's going on on the internet? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because they don't, you know, that's not, when, when we talk about uh, who is using social media, we also have to talk about like how much time they're spending on it and what they're using it for. And you know, uh, while I am proud to be an extremely online person, most people are not extremely online people in that same sort of way. Um, and I think that we need to keep that in mind when we're planning outreach strategies um, and plugging people into the left. Yeah. Um, 
So when we're thinking about who we are reaching and who we're not reaching, and especially this question of space, there tend to be spaces that you know the left will sort of seed and think that they aren't theirs, which is again why I think that talking to Kevin and talking about MH Action and talking about groups outside of New York, I guess we're in Queens, I was about to say Brooklyn, but we're in Queens right now, so New York City broadly. Um, I think that's really important. One of the things that, that Kevin mentioned was the alt-right being very good at the internet and sort of the famous claim by, I forget who it was, that the alt-right shitposted Trump into the White House. Um, I don't think they can really take credit for that, um, but they certainly helped, and yet they're sort of in disarray right now. So thinking about sort of the growth of the alt-right as this thing that you know spawned from Reddit forums and 4chan, um, how does a left sort of compete with that, intervene in it? Um, what is the what are the pitfalls of sort of trying to win some of that audience over? Emma, I see you're smiling, uh, but I'm going to make Shuja go first on this one. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> Not because I think you have any specific expertise, just because you haven't gone first yet. Uh, Not that you know anything about shit posting. I've never done it. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Um, so uh, there's a couple things. One, I mean, in terms of uh, the the greater effect, I guess, of the alt right or, or of the right wing kind of tendency within within online discourse. I mean, it seems like they had such an effect, like because obviously, you know, their guy won the election. But uh, I mean the there's already a lot of an existing power structure there that they're that they're using that they're writing uh you know it's 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 not like i mean you know everybody in the republican party is behind trump at this point it's not like they just invented him on reddit you know uh i think that one of the reasons they have been somewhat successful uh one of the things they do that we don't do is i think they're very promiscuous they're very uh kind of uh, unprincipled. They don't really care. You know, they, they're willing to work with people who uh, are not really ideologically convinced of the same principles, who just want to fuck shit up, you know? Uh, that's why, you know, I, I mean, Anonymous, I think, is entirely made up of totally apolitical people who just, like, get their kicks from, you know, transgressing uh, uh, whatever is considered to be proper, uh, which probably in their communities, you know, or, or given their contexts as, you know, young middle-class white guys is is like the liberal, you know, consensus. So defying that is what gives them a thrill, but they don't, they don't actually care, you know? And so I, I think the, the right has kind of harnessed uh, that uh, substance. Uh, and, and the question of whether I, we should be trying to do that, I, I don't know. It's very, you know, it's really certainly playing with fire, because if you're working with people who don't actually believe in what they're doing, that could go any direction. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, there are there are a lot of people who I think would be receptive to our program who just haven't heard it, and and you know, riding those waves lets the lets the all right get there first. I don't know exactly how to approach that without, uh, uh, you know, uh, empowering uh, people who are working against us. But uh, it's something to think about. I think it might be something that's necessary to work out. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have some, I guess, mixed feelings about this in as much as, you know, I think one of the reasons why the alt-right is in disarray right now, um, and it uh, brought joy to my Marxist heart to see, I think it was Southern Poverty Law Center uh, put out a really good article about this, talking about how the alt-right is essentially falling apart because of a class division that they are mm -hmm. unable to reconcile because of their far-right politics. <laughs> um, and I think the lesson uh from that for us is we shouldn't fall prey to the same 
thing. And I think, you know, um, I, I have, I'll admit, I've been one of the people who has somewhat defensively said, well, actually, DSA is majority working class, which it is, but it's a very particular segment of the working class. And I'm not, I have no illusions about that. And when we're talking about, you know, what we want the left as a whole to be and who we need to bring in, uh, you know, not to be real old fashioned, but it's, you know, it's class struggle, y'all. Like, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, contrary to what some people think, like, I mean, just go, just, you know, I, I live in Crown Heights, a neighborhood in Brooklyn right now. And, you know, just go on the, on the train in Crown Heights or even more so in like Brownsville or East New York or Hunts Point. And, you know, look at, uh, you know, without being creepy, look at what people are looking at on their phones, and it's like it's me. That sounds creepy. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing you peering over people's shoulders and them looking up, like. What? But but I seriously, wasn't. they're looking at they're looking at like memes on Instagram, and you know the difference between the sort of content that I'm looking at and the sort of content that they're looking at is. My content is, you know, about like Marx and is about like DSA, and their content is about like the Kardashians, or it's about, you know, the experience of being a black person facing so much police violence. And, um, you know, some of it's political and some of it is not. Um, and we need to look at what that social media is and engage with that social media. Because one of the problems with social media being owned by these giant corporations is it's very profitable for them to sequester us so that we're only preaching to the choir. Um, and so we have to recognize that that is a thing and break out of that mold. You know, this is something that like, I think the right has really uh, pulled off is that they've harnessed this uh, anti-elitist tendency, mm -hmm. which makes no sense. That should be, you know, that, that's, that's the side we represent. And I don't know what, when, at what point, like, uh, hatred of the rich stopped being like a universally accepted value, but it really should be, <laughs> you know, uh, that should be, uh, everyone can relate to that, right? I mean, you know, that's Except what, that's, the rich. yeah, well, good. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, but you know, that's, that's the type of energy that's coming out of like those, you know, everybody's, everybody's, uh, aunts and uncles are posting these memes on Facebook, right? Of, of vaguely kind of uh, reactionary and yet anti-elitist sentiments, right? Uh, you know, that's the, that's where, uh, you know, our uh, kind of uh, propaganda should be taking place. And I don't know. I don't know why it's not. Kevin? <laughs> it's all you. Um, I mean, sometimes with, uh, when I think about how MH Action lives online and when we encounter... Um, you know, when you do like a post with a story from say one of our senior women leaders from Humboldt County and then that gets reacted maybe poorly by some folks from a right wing bent, it's hard sometimes to understand like what is the difference between the out alt right just being loud and the alt right being the manifestation of a very effective base building campaign that went for 40 years. Yeah. So I think um, like that is I think the crux for us at MH Action is like, you know, we, we're really trying to find like folks who have followers. Like that just aren't that aren't just people that can prove like oh look I have two opposable thumbs and I've shared this thing aren't I like aren't I clever you know so I think there's like I think it's hard to know if like some of the alt right's disarray is just because like they're potentially forgetting that like oh yeah this thing is built on a very effective base building strategy that went school district by freaking school district across the country and pushed out an ideology and remembered that most organizing is done face to face and in block clubs and in communities and then out of that they had this giant base that then got hooked up with the internet right so it's like i i think like we can't we also have to be careful not to be 
like in some ways like bamboozled by truly how effective social media can be in especially places in exurban and rural America where like internet basically coverage sucks right like you can't like getting connected is you know hard enough as it is for folks especially low income folks especially folks in trailer parks so I think like I don't know always I don't know I feel like we get less concerned as it our leadership team is less concerned about like how they're being responded to by what folks they consider also just maybe alt right online crazies and like how they're actually trying to redevelop their community in a way that looks different than what it does now which could look like oh, like what's the juxtaposition of corporate ownership in their mind is what they want to talk about they want to talk about community land trusts and you know cooperative ownership and like i think like folks are hungry for that conversation and in some ways like i think that the alt right has done a good job to get people to react to the playground that they're very effective in which feels like it's just about anger racism and being as loud as possible mm. and i think um that's why yeah i think that's the struggle with knowing how good our pickup is sometimes on the left on the internet because I, I feel like like even when we are recruiting organizers to or like we think of like our organizers life on the internet is just another tool in the toolbox like I, we're not going to hire anybody like you could be a great twitter person but if you can't like sit and have like a honest frank like relationship building conversation with someone sitting across from you at the table like we're not like we're not hiring that staff person yeah. Kevin I wish you told me this privately I that I didn't get the job I just <laughs> trashed your resume like on the way in I shit posted it whatever that means I need you somebody needs to like tell me how to I don't even know what that term means actually so anyways I, I think that's um, how we think about it so when we're talking about organizing and social media and all of these things um one of the things that if probably the thing is the question of moving from sort of online to offline right we saw this with the movement for black lives you would see in sort of real time things like the, the uprising in ferguson moving from people tweeting about something to okay i'm going there um, and that kind of thing happened very organically very quickly but when we're thinking about organizing another thing that's been very successful at this is the recent teacher strikes which everybody that I've talked to has sort of cited Facebook groups as one of the places that things were starting. They're also starting, of course, in the actually existing teachers unions. But those questions of sort of how do we, not just in the moment of crisis, but in the sort of longer term, move people from being online, tweeting, putting a rose emoji in their profile, whatever it is, um, to actually showing up to a protest, to actually going to interrupt Ben Carson, say. I'm not going to sign a... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what we try to do is, in some ways, we try to get people offline, offline as quickly as... off online as quickly as possible. Am I, am I seeing that correctly? So we try to, like, in some ways, it's like, we'll reach out folks online and through Facebook and stuff like that, and then it's like, you know what you should really do is you should have a community call and do a local leadership training on these issues and here's like a training module or like we'll bring another leader from another state to come in and talk to them about their issues so some of like i feel like the online world for us it it works in the initial outreach point but then it but then the real magic happens like in the local trailer park which you know it's interesting because i guess the thing about you know the thing that this panel kind of like now has made me think about is like when you think about these communities it's like everybody shares the the same driveway to get to their house so they all kind of know each other so um and maybe that's like also the cool thing about like what's happening with the teachers unions right now it's just like they don't you know they're all in the same building together they just know each other they're getting to know each other and they you know their their gripes are similar and they're their hopes and aspirations are pretty similar and then that kind of feeds um 
feeds their movement. And I guess I'd be curious like how the DSA chapters work. Cause I think for MH action, that's like really where we're finding the folks that then could be folks with followers. Like, you know, we can then quickly delineate if they're just someone reaching out to us online saying, Hey, I'm really pissed. I want to get involved. And then we realize they live in a community with 700 people and no one else can stand them. We generally don't work with them. Right. <laughs> so it's like trying to figure out like who, where those communities are, where those community leaders are that they can pull 50 people into room to get to some level of scale. Like, you know, 50 people in far West Utah. I mean, that's like, that's the shit, you know, that's like, but um, but yeah, I think that's how we think about the offline space. Try to get people into that space as quickly as possible. Yeah, um, I think it's a. I think part of the difference is that we're we're different groups with different objectives, and as much as that, um, you know, you're part of an organizing group that I assume works usually on one or two campaigns. Um, that sort of like the central focus um, and is based on community organizing. Whereas with DSA, where where our objective is to have a a mass movement. So for us, you know, sheer numbers really is important. Whereas with you know um, ha coming from a community organizing background, you know, if I'm trying to win a particular campaign to change a particular policy, I would rather have 10 good organizers than 500 people any any day of the week. Um, but, you know, with DSA, I would rather have the 500 people because, you know, um, part of it is electoral strategy, you know, that for us, we need to get out the vote. Um, you know, that's a big part of the work that we do. Um, but it's also just about changing um, discourse, political discourse more broadly. Um, so things like social media allow us to, you know, have conversations with people that they can then replicate sort of in their own IRL lives um, and try to engage with people that they they don't deal with um, on the internet. And uh, I, I've heard that being a success for a lot of people in DSA, which is really awesome. Um, but of course, none of that matters um, if we can't get those people into the streets. So there is still that level of, you know, we have to get people to be offline as well. I guess what my difference is, is it's not getting them from online to offline, but getting them to be both. You know what's what's unusual about the about the teachers' strikes is that it's it's a type of politics that's unrelated to the American political system. You know, it's it's taking place at the side of labor, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, expelled from political discourse in in American uh, in contemporary American uh, conversation. Uh, I think a lot of people just don't know what to do. You know, maybe let's say you're you're uh, you you are in the middle of nowhere, and you're a young person who's uh, interested in left politics, and uh, you know you can go on Twitter and like uh, say mean things to you know high-ranking Democrats or whatever, and that's great. Like absolutely, you should do that. We should all do that. <laughs> we should all, all the do time. that. I mean, there's not there's no reason not to do that. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that right now. Uh, but uh, but but then what do you do? You know, in in your town, you know, it's just like if you're if you get into punk rock or something, and you're in a town where there's no shows, what do you do? You don't know what to do. So uh, order records on the internet. Well, that's that's you're still online. You know, that's that's the that's the what you're limited to. Um, I'm thinking about you know in the kind of the the meme approach is actually I think an old one. Like I was thinking about the forms of propaganda that used to be used by the labor movement. Uh, and they weren't just, uh, you know, leaflets and so on, because not everybody could read in the workforce. Uh, so I think one of the, you know, the major outlets was uh, uh, songs, marching songs, union songs, which were, you know, all set to, to hymns uh, so that everyone knew the tune and could already sing along. I mean, that's a meme, you know? Uh, but that's also something that uh, is tied to an action, which is going on strike or going on a march. 
uh, which you know, screenshots or not. Uh, so there's there's a kind of inherent uh, gap there that uh, I don't know. I mean, it it kind of suggests that uh, there needs to be a really kind of boringly <laughs> conventional and traditional uh, accompaniment to this this kind of online activity, which is just building uh, uh, you know labor power in in uh, local communities. So I have a few more questions, but I want to make sure that I leave time for all of y'all. So I'm going to ask one more, and then if nobody has questions, I can ask more. But um, So I wanted to wrap up a little bit by asking how does the, the owners of the means of production in this case play into this, right? When we're talking about organizing, using Facebook and Twitter and everything else to organize, these are things that, as Malcolm made clear, we don't own. And so how do you think about what to put on social media, what to keep off of social media? Uh, I put everything on there. I, don't, I have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, uh, uh, those who are familiar with DSA probably know that this is a conversation we have frequently. Um, and I actually fall on the side in, in general with politics. Um, I know you said only reference Russia if we're gonna talk about Lenin. So uh, I'm gonna talk about what is to be done by Lenin. I knew it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, one of the things uh, that Lenin uh, talks about in that piece is uh, the, the need for a national newspaper um, as an area by which uh, there can be discourse, and, and the whole point is that the the party actually owns the newspaper, so it doesn't depend on you know other outlets um, that can limit or censor their speech, um, and it gives people a chance to um, fiercely struggle it out. And um, I was talking with uh, someone else in DSA preparing for this uh, panel, and we were both kind of laughing about how. Um, some some folks in DSA think that like it, you know, the internal political struggles are too public and too personal. And you know, uh, if you look at some of these old issues of Pravda or really anything that Lenin writes, <laughs> I mean, he he just loves the sort of he name calling. He just like loves to call people names. And I'm not suggesting we do that per se, but I do think that. Um, as a democratic principle, actually, that uh, we need to have um, all sorts of political disagreements, even some of the more personal or some more internal, uh, we need those to be in public so that people can see that they're happening and people can engage with them. And of course, there are limits to that, um, but I think as a general principle, I lean towards you know, get it out into the public. Sometimes that means the internet. Sometimes that means bringing it up during a meeting or having a in-person debate. Um, but as long as it gets out into the public. I mean, I would say <clears throat> our content really focuses on three things. Um, so um, it's really, <clears throat> so there's one segment of our content that is like, look at this bad dude on Wall Street and look what he's doing to people. And some of those like villains are great. Like one of the uh, chaps that we <laughs> interacted with was this guy by the name of Sam Zell. I don't know if people know who Sam Zell is. He's oh, like, yeah. yeah. So Sam Zell, <clears throat> he like literally looks like a Bond villain. He's like <laughs> 70 years old, bald. He's got a little like that little thing a goat what whatever what do they call those like goatees i yeah. guess or a little soul patch yeah and uh he's like a mean asshole like he's like the guy that bought out the tribune company and like forced it into bankruptcy and i think paid for the bankruptcy by like raiding the employees pension fund so this guy was literally the guy that owned the most trailer parks in america up until last year and so he was like you know the usual raising rents decreasing community maintenance. So we have, we pushed a lot of content out there on folks like him that are just like, look at this guy, he's a jerk, look what he's doing, we should do something about it. <clears throat> and then the second thing that we really focus on are the, like the, the personal 
stories of our the folks that we're relating to um which a lot of our base right now are our senior women which is also awesome because it's just like you know don't fuck with nana right it's just like <laughs> So it's like so when you when you post that against like Sam Zell, it's like you know he's screwing over Grandma. Like let's get him. So it's like yeah, people are really like thinking about yeah, you know, that's our second piece of content. And the third piece of content, <clears throat> which really is about like our brothers and sisters that are organizing in very kick-ass ways in urban centers, right? Like the same. The only difference between the corporate owners in trailer parks and the folks that are, have taken over Brooklyn and every neighborhood in New York city at this point, Blackstone or whoever is like they're the names of the company are different. Companies are different. So the third thing that we post is we really do lift up a lot of the stories and work that who we view as our um, <clears throat> brothers and sisters in the housing justice movement in um, <clears throat> urban locales. Because I do think then <clears throat> people see the third thing about the shared fate between rural and exurban America and folks in, in cities. So I don't, <clears throat> we don't really filter our content. We, we spend most of our time just making sure that our content really reflects the story that we're trying to produce. Oh, I'm thinking about the uh, example that Emma brought up of the, uh, uh, you know, of the party owning the, the newspaper. Uh, and I'm thinking, what what would that look like today? Especially, what would that look like online? I I don't know. It wouldn't, because well, I mean, it it might in the sense that uh, it's it's not owned by anyone. Uh, but it's you know, I mean, viewpoints not a not a source for up to the minute news. Uh, that you know that does take a lot of resources to produce, uh, which we don't we don't have. But uh, I mean the the ethic of like uh, you know the kind of starry eyed uh, first wave of of, of internet uh, rhetoric was all about that, right? About I mean blogging is supposed to be that ideal, is cell phone self published, uh, and theoretically you're supposed to you know uh, it's supposed to be open to everybody. Uh, you know obviously in practice. These things are end up being somewhat unequal, and I don't know how net neutrality is going to affect that, in, in uh, or the revoking of net neutrality is going to affect that in a tangible way. I have no idea, but uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's I think maybe worth thinking about as as a a project. I don't know how to enact it, but something to talk about. All right, do we want to take some audience questions? Is anybody going to be here? Right. Got one right in front. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. We are. Yeah. Hi there. <laughs> so Emma spoke to my question a little bit, but here's here's my thing. Right. So I am a pretty far leftist, and I've actually only lived in notoriously liberal cities. But every time I've kind kind of encountered a local socialist group on either coast, and even in the middle. I've been turned off by two things. Number one is the ones I've encountered at least have been blindingly white. And there's also a lot of sublimated and even overt misogyny, like shut up about your feminism, girl. We'll get to that after the revolution. So I'm kind of wondering like when and where and how and who within the socialist movement or movements is going to deal with this. Like when is socialism gonna get for real intersectional like not just dropping the term like someone pointed out on Twitter but like actually getting down with the theory and the, the spirit behind it because I just I don't think that you can take a one note approach anymore today I don't know I would love to hear about who's dealing with that and who's challenging that within the movement because personally it's kind of kept me off of it Yeah, uh, I I think that that concern is a big part of why I think we should ha be having internal debates be as public um, and sometimes as personal as possible because, you know, that's that's historically I, I think it's um, oh gosh Jane Mitchell maybe she wrote uh, uh, an essay 
um, about uh, the socialist movement in the United Kingdom um, sort of promoting these very sort of traditional family values um, and categorizing the concerns of women in particular as being personal issues and therefore, oh, you can't talk about you know the personal issues of the group or the personal issues of the movement in public. We have to you know, bring those uh, inside so we can silence you and not actually listen to you and all that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a, un, unfortunately it's a constant struggle, but um, as a Marxist, I believe we have to work with the material conditions that were presented. Um, I know that the socialist, the US socialist movement, um, the world socialist movement is actually not majority white, not even close. Um, but the U.S. socialist movement is. Um, and so I think that uh, it's important to constantly be working um, and criticizing and engaging um, those problematic aspects of it using social media. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, the... Uh, the Socialist Feminist Working Group of DSA um, is particularly focused um, both on women issues of women's liberation, of course, but also on intersectionality um, uh, and um, sort of offshoots of intersectionality, like the idea of reproductive justice, which is looking beyond um, the, mere, the, the narrow issue of abortion in terms of reproductive uh, how we write, fight for reproductive justice and, and expanding it to things like uh, the history of eugenics against people of color and people with disabilities, um, transgender people, things like that. Um, and we are, uh, you know, I think we're the biggest socialist feminist group um, in DSA, and we are like maybe 1% of DSA in New York City. So we've got a long ways to go, but we've been really successful at making sure that our voices get heard, even if we are a minority. Uh, we're a minority with a lot of power in the organization. Um, DSA has supported intersectionality and a reproductive justice lens since 2013. Um, so, uh, it's there's a lot to f there's a lot left to fight for, but uh, there's good reason to have hope. Um, there's I think a prevailing uh, dichotomy in the way people talk about this stuff uh, all around, uh, which is you know the conversation becomes something like you know is the revolutionary class the working class or is it something else now? because of the variety of struggles that we recognize are taking place. Well, you know, it, I think it's going to be like in 10 years uh, or so, the working class in America is going to be primarily people of color. It already is? Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, th this isn't a dichotomy. This is, this is a, a simultaneous condition. Uh, so I think, I think it's really important to reject that, to not let people make that a, a, an either or. Um, yeah. My microphone. I would just add that I want to ban the term white working class. Um, the working class has never been all white. It, it will never be all white. It will be less white. And um, the, the worst thing that we can do is continue to seed this terrible frame because it's wrong and it doesn't help. And like I've been to like the carrier plant in Indiana, which Trump made a speech at, and it was about 50 to 60 percent people of color work there and a majority women work at that plant so you know that's the realities of the working class today and anybody who thinks that like we can't talk about race and we can't talk about gender because it'll offend the working class doesn't actually know what the working class looks like well and in 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 regards to social media i think it's really one of the great things about social media is being able to put out visual content in particular of course we think about memes but also just sharing like videos I think with the teacher strikes in particular, the videos, I didn't even realize how many people watch these Facebook live videos until the teacher strikes started happening. And I was like, holy shit, so many people watch these videos. And uh, I think it's really important for us to think about um, what the content we're putting out there looks like 
um, because, uh, you know, some people may dismiss that as, oh, that's just, you know, that's like very like corporate diversity, public relations to stuff. No, 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 no. We need to share with people what the truth is. And the truth of the working class is that, again, it's majority of people of color. And, you know, it has been half women since forever. <laughs> so. Uh, next question. Yeah. Go dichotomy opposite side. Since we're doing Marxism, we'll do dichotomies and dialectics and go to the opposite side of the room. So I'm glad you guys got to the point where you mentioned uh, the movement for Black Lives and Ferguson, but one of the things that I found troubling and specifically with the comparison between uh, the socialist movements in trailer parks versus combating gentrification in Brooklyn is the way in which the comparison and the use of these as mechanics elides the very real cultural nature of these two movements, right? So it's not one thing to say that we should do what the movement for Black Lives did, moving from off online to offline, and that works for everybody. That comes from a culture of meeting in the wise and church basements to wreck things. Well, not necessarily wreck things, but uh, engage in particular kinds of social change. So my question is, and it kind of dovetails a, with the first question asked, one, how do you get over the overwhelming whiteness of your spaces? And two, how do you get over the overwhelming whiteness and potential for co-opting um, mechanisms for organizing online? Because if we're going to be real about this, it's not that you're discovering anything new. You're catching up to the stuff that folks of color have been doing since we got access to mobile Twitter. How do you, how do you address those critiques um, while simultaneously bringing in folks of color, which is like three questions in one, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's also a tension about like, um, rural America's all white. Um, so, you know, beyond the tension of like this terminology around white working class, it's just like, oh, every trailer park in America is just full of white people. So, you know, we, when we think about our base at MH Action, yeah, I think historically, yes. Trailer parks, like when you did like the American Housing Survey in 2010, it was like 90% of trailer folks living in trailer parks were white folks. Um, and that still shows up for us these days, but that those demographics just like the rest of the country it's um at least in our interpretation is mh action becoming more beautiful it's much more diverse now and so we're you know it oh, it's a super huge struggle for us because sometimes like we'll be organizing in some communities that have been major super majority white for a lot of years and some of their initial definition of the trailer park going bad is because those people are moving in. It's just like, holy shit, like we've got a lot of work to do here. Um, you know, so I think, yeah, it's a huge tension and I think um, we're, we're not saying we're doing organizing any better or different than anybody. We're just responding to a condition that is now present that wasn't present 15 years ago for these a lot of these communities um, and it it's a real struggle for us on I mean what's clear for us on how we can rate how we can raise and lift up race issues for our folks because it's clear about who the owners are like you know every single one of the chairmanships of these corporate companies are they look like me Definitely, they're all white guys, all of them, to a to a to a company. So, like we we have to raise race and gender in that f formula that way, um, and that you know is really I think our first I think doorway we've been able to walk through successfully as an organization is the role of women in our organization, um, even though I'm yeah executive director, I'm a white guy. It's like, um, I also grew up with four other sisters who told me to 
fucking not be awake. Like, don't be that man fact guy when you're working in the community organizing space. So like we're, we've gone down that road and you know, we also, I think when some folks look at us at MH Action, it's like, oh yeah, you're in trailer parks, you're all right. Like that's a really offensive statement for a, a number of our leaders like Jesse Martinez and Carmen Rodriguez in Florida and Mateo Rebecca, who is our new organizer. So like sometimes we get pigeonholed at MH Action, like, oh, you work in trailer parks, like you're a white guy, you must be all white. Like that, like a number of people would take pretty significant offense to that in any of our membership meetings. So we, it's, is it all sweetness and light? Like what we're doing? Fuck no, it's fucking hard. It's messy. It's like, you know, I think, but what we have found is that, you know, hot, we're trying to pivot as quickly as possible. Like if we find a community where it's like, they're clearly organizing because they want to keep it insular to skin color of light tones like we're not going there like it's we're not gonna we're gonna have to like at some level just be like oh my gosh these are just folks that don't want to see don't have an analysis don't want to see their community change for the better it's not it's not time so i think you know do we have it figured out i will be the first to admit <laughs> that mh action is like there's days where i'm like oh my gosh this could fall apart tomorrow but i do feel like folks are definitely coming to us saying okay something is happening it's making us housing insecure how do we figure this out and i think a lot of folks in um that are organizing in urban centers led by organizers and communities of color they want us out there organizing in these trailer parks because they know a lot of the political power especially for instance in new york state the thing that's making the biggest hiccup to strengthen and improve rent laws are because of these like wacky upstate senators and and representatives right and assembly members so i think at some level like we're not saying that we've learned how to organize you city folks should organize as effectively as us like they're coming to us saying like oh my gosh can you help build the base and what would it look like to build a base in akron new york and in plattsburgh so we can shake up the state house in a way that actually delivers real victories long term for our folks in these neighborhoods that we're organizing in. So they see, like, I think we're trying to also be as responsive as possible to folks that are doing very specific requests of our organization given the geographic space that we take up. There was a, a really important point that came up here, which is uh, that for uh, a lot of communities of color, the practice of politics is extremely different than the the kind of assumed traditional practice of politics in America. It's uh, it's a day to day practice. You know, if you're dealing with police violence, if you're dealing with uh, you know uh, kind of the more subtle practices of discrimination in everyday life, uh, and you know people do have these existing these pre-existing models for uh, for fighting back. And uh, you know that's absolutely the the model to to learn from and to support and to amplify, uh, and I think that's that's you know the first priority for uh, for organizing uh, on the left. And and just to add one more thing um, with with DSA in particular um, to go into some specifics. Um, our New York City chapter formed an Afro socialist uh, group. Uh, so that people of color within DSA could have their own spaces to talk about these issues and uh, more so just to have spaces um, where they could bring uh, people of color who are interested in socialism and aren't smacked in the face by this giant crowd of white people uh, that comes up. And um, the the sort of the second thing um, in as much as like what should or what do our white, what does our white membership do um, is uh, essentially showing up, you know, when um, folks are murdered by the police in the communities that some of our members um, are, you know, part of the gentrification of. Uh, we need to go out there and we need to commit to, you know, not calling 911 on pe people of color in our neighborhoods. Um, we you know, need to, uh, for example, table outside of 
Rikers and provide just basic mutual aid support to the families who are visiting their loved ones um, in Rikers, just providing them hot coffee and some food and and just you know uh, an ear if they just need to like vent about what's going on in their lives. Um, and it's you know that way where we show that our commitment is genuine and then also show that we recognize this is an issue and we're willing um, to create spaces uh, specifically for by and for people of color um, to work out these issues. Um, I just wanted to follow up. Someone made the comment that um, protest and political ideology for people of color, um, the framework has sort of already been laid. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that that's true, but that shouldn't be gentrified. Um, I think the comment that the person up there was trying to make is that um, those strategies are necessarily different because they have to be. And so white allies are however you want to frame that conversation, their protests and their political engagement has to be different. It can't be the same uh, because we're dealing with an entirely different set of cultural practices, um, which is sort of informed the way that people of color have traditionally organized. So I think that there is, um, there is some difference and we have to recognize that there are those differences. Not a question, just a comment. Sorry, I'm that person. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you might yeah you might have seen uh, on Twitter uh, with lots of pizza emojis that pizza's running a couple more minutes, but that's cool because we're all like really wanting to talk about this, so we can, we can we can spend that time uh, doing doing this. Uh, and question here, right? Um, so I guess I want to talk about authority versus anarchy and you know the internet is billed as this anarchic thing where everyone is you know on the internet nobody knows you're a dog sort of thing that <laughs> um, but like it often seems in practice that people cluster around you know certain individuals we have you know the fact that the internet the internet is somewhat structureless but that means we have to be wary of the tyranny of structurelessness um, to reference Joe Freeman I guess um, so I guess the question I have is what do you see as the I guess the pros and cons of technology and uh, mass communication in the information age about uh, do they can they be used to break down hierarchy without creating a new one? Or, you know, what are the pros and cons, I guess? Um, I think, I mean, I think we've, we've uh, focused on the pros so far. Um, so maybe I'll focus on the cons now. I think obviously there is a tendency towards depersonalization that takes place when you interact on the internet, uh, and you know it, it it affects all of our mental health <laughs> on a regular basis. I think I think strangely the uh, the worst app for your mental health is Instagram. Yeah, apparently, I guess because it makes people think that everyone else's life is a lot more fun than their own. Yeah. Sounds fun. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I have neither, so uh, okay, thanks. Uh, but yeah, I think I think that uh, especially when there's conflict uh, around organizational matters, you know, I do think these things can can uh, become amplified past the point that they would otherwise have been if it's taking place online. Uh, you know, people tend to forget that the characters on a screen are, are, a, are a human person. Uh, that's, a, I think, the nature of the, I don't know, of the medium. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I think that Emma was talking about how it's actually really important to uh, not suppress these, these disagreements and this dialogue. Uh, so it's a question of, you know, navigating that. And I think, I think it's something we've been coming back to is, is making sure that uh, there is uh, a kind of parallel between what happens online and what happens in real life. 
otherwise, you know, it just devolves into uh, into the the shit post. Uh, I'll I'll take your cue and go a little bit negative too. Um, even though I'm a very positive person generally, um, so. Uh, I think a lot of my negativity about the internet comes from uh, a, a theorist named Jody Dean. Um, she wrote this book called The Communist Horizon, um, and in that she talks about this idea of communicative capitalism, which is uh, where uh, capitalism has successfully commodified our, our very means of socially interacting with one another. Um, capitalists want us to be as extremely online as possible because when we talk in person, uh, you know, at least probably with mass surveillance, we'll eventually get there. But currently, they're generally not making money off of us just talking in person. Whereas when we talk on Twitter or when we talk on Facebook, uh, they are. Um, they can monitor, at the very bare minimum, they can monitor the data from those interactions and uh, sell that to marketing firms and uh, all sorts of other institutions. Um, so again, we need to be w aware of that. We need to think about building our own platforms that aren't within uh, that sort of structure um, and uh, we need to not abandon entirely having conversations uh, in person. All right, I think we have time for one more. Is that, does that sound all right? Yeah. Oh, okay. where, where, where is it? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of the alt-right and the difference between organizing on the um, on the right side, organizing on the more progressive side, and um, just thinking about um, in 2016, kind of as inf more information is coming out about like really intense micro-targeting um, by the Trump campaign um, and really playing on people's vulnerabilities and anxieties. Um, I would just be curious to know, and, and I think there's also the sense that there's something about that that's wrong. Um, and, and then there's this sense on the on the left that um, there is this need to organize online to to kind of figure out political strategy online. Um, and I, I would just be curious to know. Um, and there's also like I think this idea and kind of conflict on the left of like, oh, they go low, we go high um, to just kind of know, like, how are those tensions bearing out um, in the kind of progressive um, online organizing that you all are engaged in? Well, I think part of the reason why the alt-right is in disarray, besides the class divisions I mentioned earlier, is because Antifa made them scared to show their faces anywhere. So the whole idea of uh, they go low, we go high, I think is entirely broken. And to uh, sort of echo what Malcolm said during the last panel, um, I think we are going into an era where, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot more violence. Uh, and we need to be ready and willing to uh, not only defend our communities, um, but also to use things like social media and other ways of shaping the discourse uh, to push back on these ideas. I think DSA in particular has been uh, successful at this, where you know the Democrats are saying, "Oh, we need to go to the right. You know, we need to endorse uh, you know candidates." who maybe uh, are against abortion. And so DSA responds to that by saying, oh, we're gonna pass a resolution where no DSA chapter is allowed to endorse candidates um, who are against abortion, period. Um, and I think that's the sort of um, framing and messaging that the left needs right now is combative and fierce because I think when people are scared and anxious, that's what they want to hear. They want to know that we're going to fight for them. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question for us at MH Action because we do very, you know, clearly how we build our base is very, pretty micro-targeted, right? You're a person that lives in this type of community that has been bought out by some dude on Wall Street. But I, I also think like um, 
this whole like I don't know, this whole like they go low, we go high. It's almost like oh, like going low on in the political world is like a new thing. Like that's been like <laughs> seems like that's been going on for a long time. Like so, it's hard. It's more intriguing to me. I think it's like what do we want to fight about? <laughs> Like, and are we fighting about like the right things and are we having the right conversations? Like, I really appreciate a number of the points from the, the audience tonight. It's like, it's like, it's messy out there. It's more messy now because social media has like overlaid this, has made our society much louder in some ways. And in some ways, the folks that are the loudest in a lot of ways are like, you know, the kind of the biggest bullies or assholes out there just tend to also be loud online. So I, I don't, I don't want to get, I feel like we don't want to get caught up at MH Action too much about like, they go low, they go high. It's more like, like we got to win shit tomorrow. <laughs> like people are going homeless all over the country. It's a massive housing crisis right now. And yeah, it's, it's gonna suck when we we're moving out these campaigns. We're going to take hits and people are going to like shit post us, which is such a new term. I'm going to use that a lot next week. It's going to make me hip um, <laughs> as a Gen Xer. Um, so I think like, you know, it's like whatever people take. Sometimes it's hard to delineate between like, yeah, people are taking shots because we're building legitimate power, like, you know, to shake up some policies that'll make people be able to stay in their home. That's cool. Versus like, What's folks like going low, like in a very mean, violent way? Um, I'm actually less concerned about what folks are saying to us online sometimes and way more concerned about like, you know, just actually have yeah, physical violence of, of organizing. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the problem with the going low and going high uh, uh, metaphor is that it presumes that we're meeting on equal footing, that we're meeting on neutral territory, and we're not. Things are, we're, we've been dragged down to the lowest depths uh, when, we, when we enter the political arena, uh, you know, where we're dealing with a context of, you know, institutional exploitation, of, of uh, you know, extreme violence from, from, the, from the state of mass incarceration, of, uh, you know, the, the, it's already pretty low. So you don't, you know, we don't, we don't need to go high we need to go left. All right, I'm gonna steal the mic back for moderator's privilege because that question combined with the other questions that were brought up uh, made me think about something that didn't really happen online as much, although I guess we all saw the videos, was Charlottesville, which didn't just happen once again, but repeatedly over and over again this summer, there were KKK marches and there were white supremacists that unite the right, you know, all of the neo-Nazis showing up in one place. And the thing that really happened in response to that was a big coalition of people who showed up in a bunch of different ways. So you had clergy, you had Cornell West and Reverend Seku and other people, you know, doing the like go high sort of arm in arm, whatever. And both of those two particular people said after the fact that, you know, Antifa saved my life because let me tell you, the neo-Nazis did not give a damn about beating up some black men in clergy collars. Um, and you had to have people showing up in different ways and in different roles in that space. Um, the picture that went around of uh, Corey Long, who is the care worker who, you know, was famously sort of photographed with a making a makeshift flamethrower to scare off the white guy with a, I don't think, well, there were definitely white guys with guns in any case. And like, all of that is to say that like, yeah, it's scary out there and there are we are going to have to show up in, in a lot of different ways that require really, really trusting each other and, and being willing in some cases to put your body on the line. And that as a first step requires building trust and getting off the internet. And that's how we're gonna close the panel on extremely online socialism. Get off the internet. Go eat pizza. All right.